Good afternoon, everybody, live from FDIC. It's me, Tom Merrill, host of the Professional Volunteer Fire Department. So glad you're here to join us today. I have a very special guest on hand. Uh, been my right hand person for many, many years, and now we're co-arts at uh, the Fire Commissioner, the Fire Commission District in Snyder, New York. He's a fellow commissioner. He was my first assistant chief. He took over as chief when when I stepped down. And I'm so glad to have Paul Griebner here with me today, again, live from FDIC. And Paul, it is so good to be back in Indianapolis with thousands of our brothers and sisters sharing this fire service uh, heritage that we love so much, isn't it? Uh, Tom, I couldn't agree more. I mean, it was so great that, uh, you know, we're able to get back, even though it took about a year and a half and uh, looking forward to April already. Because, Absolutely. Uh, Can't wait to get back. You know, until we got here, I didn't realize how much I missed it, but it's so good to get back and, and see everybody and meet our, our old friends. Yeah, meet old friends and make new friends. And, you know, we got here Sunday and right away it was like old home days, just running into so many people that you haven't seen in well, a year and a half or more and um, just making old connections again and, and meeting so many new people. It's already like we have a hundred new friends from people we've been introduced to and, and just start talking to like we just did at lunch. We just stopped for a quick pretzel at lunch and a couple other firefighters uh, came up to our table. One was from, was it uh, Massachusetts? And, and the other one's from Connecticut. And there we go. Two other brothers that we met today that we know if we see them out later tonight or tomorrow, boom, they will uh, be friends of ours, right? Absolutely. And that's what you get when you go to classes too. I was in the you know, as you were the training the last couple of days, the uh, four hour sessions, and I met so many people there that I now see in a hallway and you stop and talk to them. And, you know, just, it's just great. It really is invigorating and it fires you up and gets you so excited to get back home to your home department and try some new ideas and go back to responding to calls. And it's just, just there's nothing like FDIC. We're looking out over the trade route, uh, trade show floor right now. And it just sees all, see all the products out there. They're getting the booths set up and just uh, great to be back in Indianapolis and great to be back at the great FDIC. what you think of those opening ceremony, the opening ceremony today? We had the governor on hand, the mayor. Boy, they really gave us a good welcome, chief of department. Well, I'll tell you, I just wish Bobby get more excitement. But <laughs> I, I just, no, you know, and obviously I'm kidding, but I mean, Bob, I look forward to it every year. I've been coming here now, I think 20 years and, uh, you know, last, obviously a few years, Bobby, I always know that Bobby's going to get me fired up. And I know he's going to get me fired up tomorrow morning when he goes through. So yeah. it's just, and it's great. It just, it just recharges your battery. It really does. And like I said, Paul and I met when Paul joined the Snyder Fire Department in 1988, I believe Correct, it was. Sir. And Correct. we served together as lieutenants, captains up through the ranks. Um, I was just one step out of him as chief. He was my first assistant. Then he took over as chief when I stepped down. And now we're commissioners together. And we've been working so well together for years. We forged such a good partnership. We've accomplished so much and look forward to accomplishing so much more in the years to come. So FDIC, you think this is about your 20th one? Yeah, I think so. I was thinking about on the way coming down on Sunday. I remember being out at the airport and I remember that that time it was March and there was snow on the, on the grass and I, I'll never forget that. And uh, Jim Keppel was our chief. I, yeah, yeah. I believe back then. And, and, uh, and, you know, obviously now we've progressed to April and, and today, uh, this week, it's, I mean, August, it's, it's been a beautiful week. Yeah, yeah, it's one thing, too, that uh, we're so excited about. We have a beautiful week here. The weather forecast is, continues to be beautiful. When we come in April or sometimes in March, we've been lucky. We haven't really had many rainouts, but sometimes it gets pretty cool. So but we got a beautiful week here. We're just enjoying being out. Uh, you know, that's the beauty of it, too. The training is second to none. The classes are phenomenal. And then you go out at night and network. You just keep bumping into the legends of our fire service and even people that aren't legendary. They're just regular firefighters. There's nobody better, right? Like the two we just met at lunch. It's just so much fun. I, just your head spinning, talking to everybody, seeing everybody, and you're, you're fired up. And as I always tell everybody, I said, if you can only attend one conference a year, this is the one. You got to come here because it's all here. It's and whether here. you just come from the hot training, I mean, I know a lot of people just are, you know, it's obviously there's an expense to anything, mm -hmm. but if you go to, just to go to the hot train, so you're here Monday and Tuesday, or you come, I, as I used to do when I was uh, working before I retired, you know, I'd come on Tuesday night. So I was here for the opening ceremonies and, and through Saturday and the vendor show, which is second to none. 
Oh, yeah. We haven't even talked about the vendor show, which is true. There's thousands upon thousands of pieces of equipment out there and millions of dollars in inventory. Can't wait to get out there and check that out. So I just want to tell you folks that, you know, the name of my program is the Professional Volunteer Fire Department. And I choose the word professional because I think it's such an important trait of, of a firefighter. And nobody represents that better than Paul. So I'm so glad to have him on with me because since I've known him, he's been a consummate professional in everything that he does, whether it's running a call, whether it's planning an event, whether it's on the training ground or just hanging out at the firehouse or even out in the public. The man is a true professional and is deserving to be on this show. So thank you for allowing me to grab you to be on the show today <laughs> oh. at the last minute. Uh, last night, I think we were uh, By the way, I'm looking for a guest tomorrow and you agree. So thank you for being here. Oh, it's my honor and my pleasure. And, and, and again, uh, I appreciate your kind words, but uh, I will say that uh, working with you when I was especially when I was 9-1 and you were chief, uh, that I couldn't have got any better training for my five years as chief. So uh, thank well, you for thank that. Thank you. So thank you. So 20 years of FDIC. One thing we talk about, and I wanted to start off with today, is just how important it is, if you can do it, to get to class, to get to conferences like this. Um, and one thing we've noticed in the uh, fire service is we're not seeing the excitement from as many of the younger generation as we would like to see. Understand there is so much available like this online, totally understandable. Budgets are a concern, totally understandable. But what we're seeing is some people who have the opportunity don't take advantage of it. What would you like to say to anyone listening out there about the importance of maybe coming here and seeing it in person? Well, you know, and especially as a young person, and I think that, uh, you know, obviously we struggle even with getting newer members, which is a whole nother topic and class I attended as you did for recruitment and retention. But <laughs> You know, I think when we go back to the fire hall, and I know you will, and I certainly will, you know, to, to to just talk about FDIC, but but again, something like this. Now, now I'm not, you know me, I'm old guy, I'm not big on social media, but to me, that's how we get to capture the young people. And I know our Captain uh, Povino is good at that, but to me, the, the, the show, like we saw this morning at the opening ceremony, you know, those shots of hot training. To me, that got me fired up, yeah. and I'm an old guy. <laughs> and I think, you know, I, I think the young people see that, they would love that. So to me, that that is the thing that they need to look at. Yeah, we brought one of our young lieutenants. Not, he's not so young, but a newer lieutenant in our department uh, this year. He arrived yesterday, and it's his first FDIC. Been in the fire service for a while. He came to us from another department out of state, yep. but this is his first FDIC. So it's going to be interesting to get his feedback. But I could tell during the opening ceremony yeah. today he was already hooked. Oh. He was already hooked. Well, but yeah, I was, I was sitting between us, and I know he was real excited because I, you know, his reaction to everything that was going on. Obviously, Bobby and. You know, uh, you know, the Chiefs keynote, and it, it was just great, as it yeah. always is. And the bagpipes. See, I'm a, I, I love the bagpipes. <laughs> I, I always get emotional. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's, it's nothing like it. Nothing like it. What are those, uh, I think Chief Lasky calls it like Disney World for firefighters. I think that's pretty accurate, too. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And it was good to see so many people in the hall. I mean, it was, I thought, extremely well attended. Yeah, yeah. We were curious, everyone, about how attendance is going to be. You know, we've heard, oh, it's going to be terrible. It's going to, you know, because it, it changed, you know, COVID's threw everything up, right? And then the conference got moved to August and it got moved to earlier August. So we were kind of wondering, but I got to tell you, see a lot of people out there. I had my class yesterday. I did a four hour professional volunteer fire department class, 31 or 32 very engaged students. I had a great conversation with them all. And uh, I, as the instructor, I leave fired up. My students inspire me and get me excited. So, hey, it's, I mean, I, I can't believe we're already at Wednesday. I mean, it seems the week is just flying by. Unbelievable. So <clears throat> we took several classes already. Paul and I went to various workshops. We took one together. Um, for those that don't know, there's two four, uh, four hour workshops on Monday, two four hour workshops on Tuesday. Well, I just wanted to take some time and review some of the classes that we've taken and maybe just pass on a few nuggets of information to give you some highlights of these classes. Also some pointers that you can maybe even try in your own hometown volunteer department and also maybe also hook you to come to the next FDIC in April, which will be here before you know it. So the first class we took was the one we took together Monday at 8 a.m. Breaking Barriers to Recruitment and Retention by the great Candace McDonald. Dr. Candace McDonald does a phenomenal job. Oh, absolutely. Um, you were very impressed with oh, her. Oh, uh, she was awesome. 
Yeah, you, you mentioned how impressed you were. And, you know, a very timely topic, right? What fire department out there? And you send a send Tammy a, a note right now if you're not having a recruitment or retention problem, because I think that's a common thread that all volunteer fire departments share. And boy, that was a classic. The full four hours flew by and she provided a lot of great information, Paul. What were some of your takeaways from what she had to say? Well, I'll tell you one thing. And, and it, you know, we been talking about this in our home department and so coming here and taking that class but about one thing i would say is it, it's a multi-pronged approach you can it's not just one fix mm -hmm. you're going to look at a lot no of pill you can swallow you know and and to, to go out and that's what we're doing back home in snyder and and mm -hmm. I, I that just reinforced it uh what she brought up because a lot of things like you say it's just not one size fits all not one fix right you got to have multiple approaches and again like i said earlier you know, I, I, you know, the social media aspects of it, which I don't totally get, but I, I, I think that's a great avenue. And they, you know, what she talked about time she talked about, and we had gone to the high schools and she said, you know, it's too late. We got to go to the middle schools. And I, and I, I thought, thought that was a heck of a point I go, she Okay. Made. Boom. Hit me in the side of the head. Yeah. That's a great idea. Yeah. Candace said, if you, you really should go to the middle schools because by high school, the students are so actively involved in so many different things, sports, musical, whatever it might be. It's hard maybe to get the high schoolers in try to middle school. Maybe there's a junior program, but even if there isn't a junior program, you're laying the foundation, you're providing some information and you can talk to them about, hey, when you get to be 16 or 18, consider this as a volunteer opportunity. Yeah. Great, great point. Yep. What I loved and I put on my social media page was her quote, which <laughs> is, you know, firefighters hate two things, right? We say it all the time, change in the way things are. That's what the great Alan Brunacini chief used to say all the time. And Candace had a phenomenal quote when she said, we have to constantly evolve or we are going to be another Sears. <laughs> who doesn't remember? Well, we're dating ourselves, yes, maybe right. a little bit with the gray hair and, you know, <laughs> but who doesn't remember the Sears catalog, right? Especially their Christmas edition. When you were a child, you waited so anxiously for that Sears catalog to come. And for a hundred plus years, Sears was the number one retailer and they were on the cutting edge of doing things. And everybody bought things that Sears, whether it was appliances or Christmas gifts or clothing, whatever, what happened, right? They didn't evolve. Candace had a great point. She said, Sears could have been the next Amazon if they evolved. So the lesson there is, don't be afraid to say, let's give it a try. Don't be so fast to say no to everything, right, Paul? And I, again, that's why I think you need a multi-pronged <clears throat> approach because I know back home, again, we're looking at many different things. And you, and you have to, because you know what, you might go down some, one road and it's just not, doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So now where are you? Now, mm -hmm. if you have multiple things going on and we've already seen it at home, where we've expanded our boundaries and taken the different things and it's, it's already paid in the best. Right. So. Very timely for us, because as fire commissioners, we, um, we have a committee that's been coming to us to the board of commissioners with new ideas for us to consider. And we've got a few that we put in place. We expanded our borders and we're also considering other ideas that have been presented to us, such as maybe taking in members of different category types or letting members sign up for shifts instead of holding them to a percentage. Candace was big on that. She said the days of holding people to a percentage, you, you might want to rethink that. No, I'll tell you, talk about a paradigm shift. And then, you know, again, that that's one right there for me. And I think for all of us, and, you know, a lot of things we talk about are a big paradigm shift. I mean, you know, and then the older they get, the, the less you want to change, but I can, I absolutely can see the need for it. It absolutely has uh, to change because, because the world changes and that's mm -hmm. always the way it is. I mean, I'm sure, you know, the people 40 years ago said the same thing. I don't know what's going to happen to the volunteer fire service, but, yep, but yep. here we are. So yep. I know we'll evolve. I know we'll, 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 we'll do it. We'll do what we have to do. It's just that I, right now, maybe the picture isn't real clear, but we'll get there. Yeah. yeah. And Candace pointed out too, you know, the cost of recruiting and, and getting volunteers started out is starting out is very, very expensive. So she spent a lot of time about how to keep them how to motivate them to stay, how to retain them. Retention is such a big thing. And just a couple of things she said is um, one of the things that I think we're getting better at is once you hook them, is keeping them. There's so much competing for people's time today. There's so many other distractions that they can easily walk away if they're not engaged immediately. So she said, yeah, you got to obviously put them through a process of orientating them 
but you got to do it organized. You've got to stay in touch with them. You've got to communicate with them and you've got to give them things to do pretty quickly or they're not going to feel valued. And if they don't feel valued. And the other thing, you know, Tom is, is, is again, you know, listing the expectations, you know Mm -hmm. what, Mm -hmm. you know, when they come through the door, I mean, most people walk through the door and they have no idea. In fact, most of the time people don't even realize our fire company is a hundred percent volunteer. Right. You tell people that, and you've, you've said the same thing. They're, they're, they look at you like, are you kidding me? Mm-hmm. You know? And, uh, but anyway, so the, the, anybody walking in the door, we get them that far, you know, you got to sit down, you got to sit with them and say, hey, these are our expectations. This is what it's going to, because they need to know up front. Cause like you said, if they come in and all of a sudden it's this, wow, unsurmountable mountain, you know, you're definitely going to lose them. So yeah. you gotta, you gotta let them know what's expected you know, like the first year, the second year, all those things, you know, percentages, all those things. Yeah. You know what that's called? Communication, there, right? There you the go. C word, communication. And you know what, Candace, another thing I just thought of that she said, so astute, Dr. Candace McDonald's phenomenal instructor, great information. Remember what she said? And I think you were, you liked it too, is ask them how they want to be communicated with. Right. You know, oh, we yeah. might just assume everybody good. wants a text. That's not so true. We might just assume that people prefer phone calls. That's not so true, yeah. is it? <laughs> oh, that, you're right. And that was funny when she said that because we looked at each other and say, yeah, you know, that's, that's absolutely true. So, yeah. So she said, you know, you have three to six months is what she said of a window of opportunity to really get them involved in the organization. And if they don't in those first three to six months, you could lose them. So engage them, talk to them, communicate with them, find out what the organization can do for them to make them successful. What are they looking to get out of Yeah, it? and you're right, Tom. And, and yeah, what are they going to get? Out? And include family too. Don't forget that. Uh-huh. You know, there's so much going through my mind right now. I don't want to forget it. But yeah, uh, one, one of the things is is certainly, in, you know, what do they get out of it? What's a little person get out of it? Mm-hmm. What is their family? Well, we want to include the families because we know without support at home, you're not going to be able to do it. Right. And then the other thing is a, a mentor program. I, 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 I've been big on that. I, I, we don't have it to be quite honest. I want to see it at Snyder and I, I would love to be a mentor. And, and so somebody comes in and assign me that person and, and it's awesome. Mm-hmm. I, I will, I think it's a great thing. I think anybody coming in, like I said, really, uh, they're not going to know and they need someone to be able to call, Hey, Paul, you know, this is what's going on. Can you tell me what's going on or me to be proactive? So I think it's, it's a very valuable thing. Mm-hmm. And then she said, this was a sobering statistic, folks. We love the volunteer fire service, right? We celebrate this brotherhood and sisterhood, right? But you know what the study says? 38%, only 38% report being satisfied being a volunteer firefighter. That blew me away. Yeah. Why is that? What are you thinking? Well, you know, I, I you know, what? sometimes I, because I've been doing this a long time as have you longer than I have, but, you know, sometimes I think that, the, well, and you're not older, I'm older than you are, but the, uh, no, I think everything changes, and I think family dynamics have changed, and and work uh, and things have changed at work. You know, we used to have the shift work, and I first started. You know, we had a lot of shift work. We don't yeah, have it. Yeah. Things have changed, and and your time, and 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 the kids are more involved, and it just at least it seems that way to me. Right. And I just think, that, and that's what happens. Society changes, and I think. You know, you made the point to me the other day about, you know, people still volunteer, but they don't necessarily volunteer in the, as a firefighter. They're, they're doing other things. They're, there's a lot of volunteer opportunities. Because sometimes, I mean, uh, you know, the millennials get that bad rap and not being volunteers, but that's not true. No. But, but what it says is they're volunteering, but in different areas than you and I did when we were, you know, just coming up and getting into our 20s and 30s and, and got interested in the fire department. Right, right. So you got to engage them and talk to them about how the fire department can work for them. And then listen to what they offer you. They might have some skill sets that you could put to use and they might not all involve dragging that hose line down the hallway. But hey, you need someone to do your social media. You need someone to do administrative work. You need someone to do fundraising. You need somebody to do uh, treasury work, all those. So, you know, see what's out there in your community and put them to work. And you know what else is out there in the community? I think it's pretty much in every community, females. And what's the percentage? 9% of the fire service is female. You think there's a recruitment opportunity there, people? I think there is. And you know what? We've had many successful females, as I'm sure the thousands of listeners have as well in our department. And and fortunately, we still do. I mean, not to the number that you and I would like to see, but you're right. You know, I I guess maybe there's still a perception out there, and I'm sure there is, 
that you know this is a male dominated thing, which which we know is it not was, true. It was at one time, but we're true. breaking the barriers down. Yeah. Absolutely, but sometimes things stick. You know, even though things have changed, sometimes that perception doesn't change. So, I mean, obviously, it's it's uh, you know all of us have to to make sure we we get that word out there, and whether it's on our websites or whether it's obviously in our you know our uh, recruitment uh, uh, programs that right. we put out there, and uh, you know we we need to make sure that that. Everybody feels wrong. I'll give you a real quick example. And, and, and you know, we go to a fire prevention at like a school or a preschool. And I, you know, I love to take our, if our one of our female firefighters can go, that's awesome. You know why? Because the little girls in the audience are, they look at, they go, oh, you know what? I too I can be a firefighter. I think Candace mentioned that during her talk because she kind of looked at it saying, you know, oh, oh uh, I guess, you know, the, only the boys can be a the firefighter. Well, certainly we know that's not true. So again, another great opportunity uh, for for the boys and the girls in that uh, in that preschool class, and we have a very strong female firefighter from our area accompanying us here on this trip. We were with her a couple of times already this week. She's a neighboring uh, uh, first assistant fire chief, a deputy chief in some areas. It's referred to in our area. It's first assistant chief um, from uh, the Clarence Fire Company, and uh, she does a phenomenal job. It's fun being with her, and I predict she'll probably be the first fire chief in our immediate area that we've had we've had several assistant fire chiefs but they've stepped down uh when other life obligations got in their way but i i think she's going to do a great job oh, she, she does do a well. great job yeah, she's a, she yep yeah, yeah, she's she's well prepared for the job absolutely so <clears throat> excuse me one other thing candace talked about she sat with us and gave us a game plan of how we can retain members and how we can re, uh, recruit members and she said start off with creating a list of the jobs that you need to do in your department. And we wrote those jobs down and, you know, you think it's all oh, firefighting. Oh, it's EMS, maybe driving. How many other jobs did we come up oh, with? I, I mean, yeah, like a dozen. <laughs> oh right? my I mean, God. It was just, there are, when you think about it, I mean, it's, it's, I always think of it as a small business or a medium sized business mm -hmm. you know, because that's what it is. Mm -hmm. You know, we need many different people, you know, the, to do, to support the operation. Right, right. And then she got into having this onboarding process that gets them involved quickly, but not just that, tell them what they need to know to be successful. Tell them what your house rules are. Tell them all the little miscellaneous things that they maybe were told when they were interested in joining, but now that they're a member, make sure they truly understand what it means to be a firefighter. You can't get mad at somebody for say a social media post that's against your standard if no one told them what that standard is. So you gotta put together an organized onboarding program. The day of throwing gear at somebody and saying, come on, just start going to calls, it's over. <laughs> I remember you and I, we both done orientations in our career and uh, new members. And I always felt bad for them because I felt I really overwhelmed them. and hardly scratch the surface. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and she also mentioned, you know, to get those members, one thing I left out about that is, and it's never thought of it, always have an action button if you're advertising on your social media pages. Click to submit or click for application. Don't ever not, dis don't discount how important that is. You're hooking them with that information or that exciting graphic, whatever it is, make sure you got a click to submit button with that, or at least click here to send an email for more, to get an email with more information. So, so important. And the point too, she said about having both the written and electronic application form. So me, I would print, I would download the, the uh, paper and, mm -hmm. and mail it in, right? But but most, a lot of, probably a lot of people would just fill it out electronically and hit the send button. Yeah, yeah. So, but I have both. So, <laughs> as I thought that again, another great little point that it probably seems obvious to most people, but what's that having the two? Having yeah, the two. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's just like, duh. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, it's like some people don't like text, some people like phone calls, exactly. vice versa. So, exactly. yeah, I may mean, have two versions of it, right? And then um, the other thing she said about teaching them about all the miscellaneous rules and tidbits is teach them what it means to be a firefighter. Teach them what it means to be a firefighter. I talk about that in my class. It's not all hooks, halligans, and hoses. It's about ethics. It's about integrity. It's about behaving correctly and treating people nicely and respectfully. The public, but our own members as well. Oh, absolutely. Right? And, and having pride. I mean, you know, I know you talked about that in your class and she talked about it. And, you know, it's, it's, it's wearing the it's wearing the T-shirt and, and you know, presenting yourself well at, at calls or wherever you are, whenever you're wearing that T-shirt. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you are representing that fire department. And during the orientation, don't be afraid to invite the family in. Involve them in some way. Let them know what they can expect. Yeah, I thought that was a great point. In that. 
Yeah. And then, so now we get them in and how can we best accommodate them? She talked about shifts. She thinks, again, we talked about this at the beginning. She's thinking the day of the percentage system maybe has passed us by. Should we panel, should little, I'm sorry, should the parent be penalized for missing um, a fire drill because they were at their child's softball game? Should they feel guilty if they choose going to an emergency call over little Jane's soccer game? Let them sign up for shifts that they can be committed to, to be able to go to calls and training. Some can do it for 24 seven. I think that's difficult. It can be done. I've been in companies that have done it, been involved in companies that have done it, but why not let people maybe volunteer hours instead of having to hold them to a percentage? Well, hmm. and, and again, that's, that's what we talked earlier about having right. a multiple prong approach. I mean, maybe there's not one, one way to do it. Right. I mean, you can, I think you can have both. I mean, why not have a, a duty uh, program where people can come in because that's that works better for them and still have a percentage program? Mm -hmm. Why not do both? Right. I mean, I mean, I don't think there had anything's mutually exclusive here. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then she also talked about um, how to accommodate the, uh, the training. Um, maybe you can be more flexible, you know, and we fall into this in our, we're very rigid with training back home in our department with yep. every Wednesday night, been yep. that way since yep. I think 1952 is when it went to Wednesday nights. If I know our history, of course correctly. You, do. you know our history, <laughs> but um, yeah, Wednesday night, it was Friday before that. And what did she say? Friday actually in some departments works better, because which because they don't boom, have to that, get up Saturday morning. That blew work. me away. That well, blew I, me away. When I was in Kenilworth, we did Friday night. Okay. Paul so, did the Friday night. So, but, uh, but I think again, uh, yeah. So multiple, uh, instead of just one night, multiple plus also recording it. I mean, yeah. you know what? So people can do it whenever they're, they have the convenience to do it. Not all drills are, can do that, but there are a lot that can do that where you can actually do everything online. We just experienced this with Zoom, right? In the we pandemic sure and, uh, sure and different things. So I we know it works. And then one other big area she really spent a lot of time on was non-wage benefits to make people oh. feel good about being at their department, giving them other things to do. Another huge list that we came up with. She, she liked, talked about the swag items. I thought that was yep. interesting. Yep. You know, give, give them stuff, swag. you know, yep. give them the t-shirts, right. the hats, yeah, the hats. jackets, yep. things like that. But, <laughs> right, right. I, I never heard that word before, but I don't know, what do I know? But, um, and then she, I mean, when we came up with this list of non-wage benefits of things we can do, or no, she actually asked, what are we doing in our firehouses? Do you remember some of the things, a fitness room, some fire companies have, or what, a fitness contract with neighboring uh, or community gyms and, right. and workout places? Right, yeah, go to your gym and see, you know, what can you get a couple passes and then everybody kind of shares the pass. So, you know, you use it whenever you can and everybody can access it and so there's a lot of different things that we are, and, and a silly thing that you and I talk about, which I think is great, is our wash bay. Yeah. I mean, that sounds dumb. Well, you live in Buffalo, it's good to, to uh, rinse the salt off the car. And that's believe right. me, that's a big thing. It is. It is. You get used quite a bit. We have an empty apparatus bay in our firehouse. It's designated the wash bay where we can bring our family cars in and wash them off. And it does Very get used popular. quite a bit. I said, basically, it's only from... It's only from like September right. through April, right? That we're in there rinsing it off. Well, now you sound like we have snow eight months a year, which we do not. So what are some other non-wage benefits? How about a game room, TV games, or how about free snacks, sodas, and chips? And you mentioned one that came up, which again, seems silly. The use of tables and chairs for parties that you're, you know, you're we at a graduation party for my daughter back at the end of June. And where did I get the tables and chairs? From the firehouse, That's right? Right. That's right. A non-wage benefit, and it sounds like a silly thing, but again, it's it's a you know people appreciate that. They talked about also maybe sure you get together, you know, having picnics and include the family. And again, I I know we talked about it, but I think that's so important. Uh, the family has to be on board. Yeah, on board. absolutely. And she talked about team events, you know, the picnics like you just mentioned, but also team building events where you bring the family up to the firehouse for a movie night. You know, she pointed out a call might drop and the firefighters have to leave for that call. The families are still there together. They get to meet each other. They get to know each other. Kids play together. Now you maybe have a party down the road a little bit and people now know each other just that much more. And they make that connection. Yep. Absolutely. All absolutely. good stuff. Train, bring the family in on a training night. There's family drills that can be done together. She mentioned some yep. of those. Yep. Well, she mentioned how about health and nutrition. 
physical fitness. Yep. Doesn't have to be all fire or EMS related, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of things. And again, I, I'm sure a lot of people listening to us have a, a ton of ideas that we haven't thought of that Candace hasn't thought of. So true. So that was Dr. Candace McDonald's class. And I've got a ton more notes on that. But um, I know we took other classes. And I don't want to be a downer here. But the class you took Monday afternoon with Commissioner Bugby from our department was another real eye opener, wasn't it? Paul? Well, I wondered it, if you could talk about that. And you know, it's the firefighter cancer. It's the firefighter cancer uh, uh, that I've learned so much about over the last few years that uh, and I think it's so important. And we just took another class with uh, with Bob Callahan mm -hmm. that uh, reinforced that. But it's just so super important and so much education. And that's, again, why you love to come to Indy, because you learn so much. And uh, the firefighter cancer is, is, is certainly it's 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 it, we all have to be aware of it. And I don't care what your age is. You have to be aware of it. Uh, we've done so many things differently now. Simple things like gross decon at the scene, you know, washing your clothes, uh, your gear when you get back to the fire hall, washing your clothes when you get home, washing yourself, right? Shower within the hour. I love that because it's so easy to remember that phrase. And uh, we just got to do such a, a better job of it. I, I, I'm a, I'm, I'm little, I, I hate to admit this, but I was one of those guys that had the dirty faces and, and the, my helmet, uh, that one time was white was is now you know a, a much darker color and that was like that was something to be proud of well no it was not and, but i didn't know any better and we didn't know any better so uh, you know I, I i anybody out there i i tell you the firefighter cancer we, we have to be aware of it we have to do our air monitoring we have to be on air uh you know we just there's just there's a ton of information out there and i just uh, encourage everybody to to just look into it you know, um, I remember coming back from fires back in the day and thinking it was so cool to blow your nose into a hanky and have nothing but dark, you know, residue from the fire. And I remember um, just the, the, the smell would be in my car for weeks because you didn't wash your gear. And, you know, the bottom line is, and we have, we have a couple, I, mean, I, I tell the story in my class, folks, we in my town, and I've probably said it on my show before, but in their memory, I'm going to say it again. In our town of Amherst, New York, 52 square mile town protected by 10 volunteer fire departments, three chief officers in a 14 month period died of cancer, two in their 40s, one in their early 50s. So I want to just say it's very real. Mark Heim, Radar Riley and Mike Morris. God rest their soul. They were wonderful men, great chief officers. And that, more than anything, says to me how real this is. They died of crazy, on real crazy cancers that they can't even really explain. The only common denominator was they were firefighters. So this cancer scare, epidemic, whatever you want to call it, it's real. It's real. And yeah, and but and we've learned so much, Tom, as we I have. already said, you know, things that we can do and we do do them now. And and, and it's it's never too late, never too late to, to pick up those good habits. Now that we, we know more, the more, you know, we, we're educated and and now now it would be a, a crime if we don't follow because now we are educated. OK, I can use the excuse I didn't know any better. But you know what? Now I do, Tom. And I and. So shame on me if, if I don't do the right things, if we don't go through the gross decon or make sure that everybody goes through the gross decon and remind people or use the wipes. You know, we have the wipes on yeah. the trucks now to wipe yeah. off your, your neck and, and you know, your face and, and everything, all those vulnerable areas. And, and more importantly, just, you know, wash your clothes when you get home and jump in that shower. Right, right. Stuff that doesn't even cost a lot no, of money. No, it doesn't, anything. Right. I mean, it doesn't cost anything. You I should know, be doing that anyway. <laughs> I know they sell a lot of rinsing, tools and that and you'll probably see them on the trade room floor but you know what dawn dishwashing soap and a bristle brush with a little garden hose adapter on your pumper does wonders for cleaning the gear yeah, doesn't that it? dawn does for wonders for everything i think but yeah, yeah. <laughs> so true so true so true so cancer uh, awareness cancer prevention you know a little another inexpensive or free thing you can do go on the national volunteer fire council's website they have a wonderful poster you can download and print on steps that can be taken to reduce the cancer yep. risk in your firehouse. And you can post those throughout your firehouse. Great reminder. And I know I've said this before, you know, we just talked so much about recruitment and retention. Um, I guess that could be a real detriment if we don't handle it correctly, because it's almost like join the volunteer fire service and get cancer. No, 
No, if we take the steps and show that we're professionals taking the steps that are necessary to mitigate the risk, then, then we're doing the right thing. Yeah, and one of the, in fact, I've, I've got something I'm going to take home, a couple of posts, just what you can do for yourself. You know, three steps that you can just, you know, to, to check yourself to make sure, you know, there's something that's different, you know, it, and it lasts longer than two weeks, you know, those kinds of things. It's, it's real easy stuff. And it's stuff that, you know, it's not a, you know, a one glance at all of our firefighters walking by our board there is going to, they're going to see that. And, and hopefully they're going to say, okay, look, you know what, that's great information. Those are the kinds of things that it's easy to do simple to do and uh, uh, hopefully you know uh, people will will take advantage of it oh, absolutely yeah so one of the other classes while paul was in that one i went to a class on how to be a better instructor how to be a better presenter of information and did it, was, it work yeah, i don't know i'm sorry <laughs> still struggling i'm sorry department. i've known him a long time <laughs> this was taught by steve crothers from the seattle fire department and he said some great points in that class you know he, he said departments need to do a better job teaching how to be a better instructor because so often what happens is and i thought of this in the volunteer fire service for sure it's congratulations brand new lieutenant brand new captain here's your new helmet here's your new badge oh by the way teach scba training next tuesday night or you're the best nozzle firefighter in your department you're the best emt or paramedic so naturally they think you're just able to teach the subject matter. Not true at all. We need to give our members the tools necessary, give them the, the, the information that they need to just make themselves a better instructor. And he had some great points in there. He talked about PowerPoint. We all use it. I use it, but avoid the death by PowerPoint where you're turning your back to the audience and just reading every slide. He prefers, and I agree, less words, more photos. Let the photos tell the story that you are telling. The PowerPoint should supplement you as the instructor and help pass on the information more than the words that are on there. And you've got to take the time to prepare. You got to practice. We had funny stories in the class about how people practice. He said he'd be in the shower and rehearsing and it would, his wife would pass by and wonder, who are you talking to while you're in the shower? Me, I'll tell you a true story. A lot of times when I'm going to do a class and it just happened before I did my class this week, sometimes I'll wake up and it's not healthy. Three, four o'clock in the morning, it's going through my brain. Things I'm going to be talking about, things I'm going to be saying. But the bottom line is for anyone that's going to instruct, help yourself get better by reading about some points that instructors um, that have out there that you can read from about what makes it better, what your students can learn from, how they can learn from you better, and um, how to maybe put a good PowerPoint program together. And he offered some just great information on how to do that. And uh, I took that class while you were in your cancer class, but then you also took another class that I did not attend on peer support. Did you not? Yes, yes. Uh, Commissioner Bugby and I did. And again, another great class. I, I'm four for four on my classes this the last two days, but the peer support one was uh, just opened my eyes to a lot of things. I really wanted to educate myself as did uh, Captain Bugby. And, you know, and it really did. And it just basically, and anybody can do this. No, there's no training here. This, this is, you're just being a human being. You're just, all you have to do is be a good listener and you know you know just be a good human being and show and uh, and you're there for your fellow whoever it is in this case obviously our emphasis was on our fellow firefighters but all you got to do is be there for them and we've all heard the sad stories right the suicides and you know all the, the stories that are out there but you know we can all be that peer support person mm -hmm. again we every one of us can do that and it's just a question of being able to you know kind of keep your eyes open to see hey is somebody that i know acting differently are, are they all of a sudden real quiet now you got you got a, a person that's all of a sudden uh, really into and all of a sudden you notice they're kind of in a shell is you know do you take the, you take the time to go over to them and talk to them they may or may not open up but right. you know what you 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 know you're there for them and you let them know that you're there for them and i that class was fantastic and uh, i'll tell you it's just uh, again another thing to me a little bit like firefighter cancers and and kind of getting the word out there because we can help ourselves 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, just great examples of all the different classes that are here. And we're just barely scratching the surface because we can only go to one at a time. And uh, the last two days, it was uh, two classes a day. So um, it's continuing all week here with some, some shorter classes and there's just so much more to take. Um, you know, you mentioned about the peer support and um, supporting each other as brother and sister firefighters. Uh, it reminds me of the class I took yesterday, Courage Under Fire Leadership uh, by Chief Steve Przewalski from uh, California. And a couple great points he had uh, as far as leadership goes. Um, he talked a lot of good points on leadership, but I just wanted to cover a couple of them. And one that uh, came to mind when you just mentioned about um, being there and supporting each other. You know, he talked about how we used to really be good at being brothers and he said brothers, meaning brothers, female and male, and not backstabbers. In other words, sometimes he feels that we're too quick to not support each other um, and recognize to sometimes people have very real struggles and a good leader helps their people and under, works to understand their people and get to know their people and then support their people any way they can. Um, in this class, he talked about the importance of communication, and he said, you can never communicate enough. People want to know what is going on in their organization. They want to know the why, why things are being done. And the best way to get ahead of the rumors is to get in front of it by openly communicating. Talked about all the different ways there is to do it, department newsletters, and if you're a chief officer, you know, don't be afraid to sit down with people. Now he's in a big department. It's hard for the chief to get in all the firehouses. If any paid chiefs are out there listening with smaller, there's no reason you can't bounce around from departments to talk to people, get their feeling, ask them how they're doing. Right. What can we do better for you? Right. And then get out in front of any of the rumors, tell them what some of the plans are for purchases and new equipment or changes like that. And then he talked a lot about training. He had a quote about be ready when that bell rings rings and part of being ready when that bell rings means you've been talking to your people so you know their strengths and their weaknesses and you know what you can do again in the volunteers this is huge you know when you give an order that person is capable of doing it we all have our a members and b members we all have our interior strong structural firefighters we all have scene support members and we have interior members that maybe aren't so strong we volunteers have members afraid to climb right they're not ladder people know your yep. team yep. know your team yeah right not everybody's comfortable on that roof so uh you know that's but uh communication i think that that's uh you know i think that's a key that you mentioned and and that's important in every aspect mm -hmm. absolutely um you talked a couple things too which i found interesting on dispatching of calls and the importance of repeating back critical information he had a very real example mm -hmm. of critical information not being repeated um, a fire happened where a woman was trapped and all the information was being relayed to the incident command or the chief that was responding. And he said, copy that or something very similar to that. But he never really acknowledged yeah. that the dispatch was saying there's somebody trapped there. Turns out maybe he didn't know or because uh, she did pass away. Unfortunately, and the audio tape from that, it was really uh, interesting. Um, well, and then, Tom, you know that that's what you do. Yeah. Yeah. So you're you're. Uh dispatcher so you understand the importance of that and i was chief that was very important because sometimes you know obviously you miss stuff it's easy to do there's a lot going on and so it's it's great to you know again it's communication yeah for so. sure for sure the chief also talked about um what he called personal leadership it's about leading ourselves you know how can we ex be expected to lead others if we can't even lead ourselves and all that we say and do, right? Okay. And he had a couple examples that he talked about to reinforce what he meant by that. Um, and he talked about like little things like parking in the fire lane. How many times you see fire chiefs that think they can park in the fire lane when they run into a store? Is that the right thing to do? I personally witnessed that in our town once when I was chief and parked in a normal spot and walked into a sporting goods store and saw a chief's vehicle parked in the fire lane. I thought they had a call, but then I'm like, no, they didn't. Cause I would have heard it on the fire radio. Right. Well, maybe they're here on a quiet call where they right, didn't get silent. Okay. No, they were shopping with their family. Okay. So I don't know. And uh, we just didn't think, you know, that's not really personal leadership. Um, he told the story actually where they were doing it once 
and uh, his uh, driver pulled into a fire lane and they were outside the vehicle and a woman came out of the store and said, must be nice to park illegally. Mm -hmm. And the response from the driver without missing a beat was, lady, we're fire lane testing. <laughs> and she bought it. <laughs> what exactly is fire lane tasting? <laughs> testing right <laughs> it's good to be quick on your feet i guess so you know. uh the, yeah, he talked about integrity and you know, we always talk about integrity doing the right thing when nobody's looking great point you ready right. for this I'm he ready. changed it he I'm said ready. he thinks it's more integrity is doing the right thing when everybody is looking okay. because what he meant by that with today everyone's looking Everybody there are looking. cameras well, everywhere yeah, yeah. cell phones up in buildings you, you're being watched you mean your doorbell camera? You know, that kind Thank of thing? you for bringing that up. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to segue right into that. So someone came up to me after my class yesterday. I talk a lot about behaving appropriately at a scene. Um, sometimes we get more than enough help inside the house on a medical call, right? So we have some volunteers out at the street talking by the rescue squad or the ambulance, right? Sometimes it's even at a fire, right? People are in groups talking while we're finishing up overhauling or whatever the case may be. This fire chief came up to me yesterday at the conclusion of my class and said, hey, Tom, do you ever uh, think about adding a section in there about being aware of these ring doorbells? And I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> well, they had a call in his department and some of the firefighters were out front and they were talking inappropriately. I didn't hear what they said, or, but it was all captured by the ring doorbell and this homeowner saw it and this fire chief got a pretty nasty phone call. So be aware of that. Be aware of how we're acting and what we're talking about and what we're saying even if we think we're out of sight and view of a homeowner or business owner, because you know what? It's all there. And yep. that you don't know when it's even being, it's most times it is being recorded, right? Yes. More so, times than not, I think. Yeah. So that is, you know, personal leadership and this uh, Courage Under Fire Leadership, great, great class by Chief uh, Przewski from, uh, from the California area. That was a, that was a great uh, four hours that was spent. And what was the other one that you took then? Oh, I want Mr. Brad Pinsky. Ah, and, yes. Uh, our friend, know, Mr. Pinsky. Our friend, Mr. Pinsky, who is a, a very dynamic speaker, as anybody in the audience knows that. But uh, again, it, in my role as a commissioner, uh, you know, those are the kinds of classes that sometimes you just have to take. And there are policies and procedures. And it's always good to get refreshed because there's always something new. You got to cover your you know what on and uh, to make sure we're up to speed. And so it's great. It's great information. It's a ton of information. I mean, Brad has so much information. Fortunately, he sends it to you. I don't have to make notes, you know, because it'd be too much. But just basically, you know, your policies and procedures and, and, and for uh, not only not 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 for necessarily operations, although that's part of it, but also for, you know, what you you know, just your rules and regs, right. You know, and explain the difference between, you know, what, what a policy is and what are, you know, it's, and, and, and best practices. He taught, I mean, just a lot of different, just great information. Isn't one of the big hot topics now marijuana? Well, in New York, it is. <laughs> I think it's probably going to be <laughs> in a lot of places. It is, and it's new for us, obviously. And of course, that's going to have a huge impact on uh, on the on the fire service, obviously. You know, and I mean, we, certainly the, the big the definition there is impairment. You know, our firefighters impaired, and and how do you is there a test for that? And the answer is well, no. And uh, you know, if if we're at least I'm not up on the latest and greatest in the uh, uh, you know with the uh, technology, but. Obviously now today, what do we do? We do a breathalyzer. If somebody, we suspect them of alcohol, it's a breathalyzer or, you know, it's a blood test. But what do you do with, with marijuana? What happens when you're at home and you're enjoying your legal marijuana and, and then you come and heaven forbid something happens. Let's say you're a driver, right? And, and you have that accident. May or may not be your fault. So it's a challenge, I think, more than anything for the fire service. Mm -hmm. But as professionals, something to stay on top of, something to consult your legal people about and think about for your organization, your department. And then Paul and I just took a class that uh, what I thought was absolutely fantastic. And that was small boxes, big problems. It was all about fires in box stores. Who out there doesn't have a box store in their district? Who doesn't have a Dollar Tree? Who doesn't have a hardware store, CVS, a Walgreens pharmacy, right? They're out there. And he pointed out so well the challenges associated with box fire, uh, box type store fires. And you can't apply residential tactics at a box fire. 
a box store fire. And uh, Bob had so many great points, did he? And not? I think one of his best points were pre plan. Get out there and pre plan that building because otherwise your muscle memory tells you, okay, I'm going to do what I do at a house fire. Right. But instead, this isn't a house fire. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was an excellent point and, and the importance of doing pre-plans, which isn't the glory work, right? right. No, he mentioned that. Work. He did. Yeah. And you know me, I, that likes was one him. of my passions. I enjoyed doing pre-plans when I was uh, chief, but I, it's just, uh, that just reinforced that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, he also talked about how these are low frequency, high risk events, you know, and if you don't have a lot in your, he called it the Rolodex. If you don't have a lot of experience dealing with these types of fires, you're, you're, you're going to be behind the eight ball to start with, you know, that Rolodex so often are events that we've been familiar with. So maybe we get a lot of residential two and a half story house fires. So our Rolodex, boom, there's a fire right to the front of our brain. We're good to go, but then this happens and boy, are we struggling. So pre-plans are important. Know the buildings in your district, kind of know the layout. And how about the importance of the void space awareness? Huh? Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, he gave a lot of good tips about obviously checking the void space and everything. And I only have one question. What's a Rolodex? No, I'm kidding. I mean, <laughs> You're old enough to know what a Rolodex is. I think you got the gray hair. You got but, but he brought that up. That's why it wasn't my line. It was, you know, he said, you ask anybody in the room that doesn't know what a Rolodex is. You know, of course, you're right. I'm old enough to know. Oh, my gosh. So, too. Uh, no, he had, he had great information. I mean, just did a great job. And uh, so I'm glad I went. Yeah, great the, class. The big, big, a lot of takeaways from that class. Um, just know your buildings and be ready for you know, the non-traditional fire, um, because you can't employ your normal traditional tactics at those types of fires. So just a small sampling of some of our takeaways from FDIC 2021, a small sampling of how many great classes are available to the students that come here. And I can't emphasize, and Paul can't emphasize enough the importance of coming to training like this if your budget can afford it Call, go to the training in your area get our younger members to embrace the training because you know what else happens at these events and i'll end on this the networking oh gee can't beat it second to none right we solve a lot of problems at night here don't we tom you're one of the best here uh, <laughs> Solve a lot of problems the best at, at FDIC at, after hours, after hours. So that's it for us. Um, just another great FDIC. I'm so excited. I got three full days left here and uh, looking forward to coming back in April. And <laughs> Paul, thank you so much for being my special guest, Chief Paul Griebner, Commissioner now, Paul Griebner from the Snyder Fire Whatever Department. The East Snyder Fire Department, where I'm also a commissioner serving with Paul. And thank you to listening to another episode of the Professional Volunteer Fire Department. Thank you to Fire Engineering, Clearing Events for the invitation to be here again. Thank you, folks. Thanks, Tom.